him, follow him, but don't worship him. This is what the book says. So now when you read it, it says, look, this, this seems to be something objective. It's not something, you know, a man is just trying to score points. Yes. You see the Imam, the leader, during the high time of the day, he is facing the same direction as the congregation. He is not talking to the congregation. He is talking, say to say, to God in that direction. So now on Fridays, only on Fridays, in the mid-afternoon prayer, the Imam, the leader, he goes on top of the steps to give him the bandit one to wish to speak to the congregation and he delivers a sermon. He serves the purpose of standing for the one far more easily and better eye contact. There is no, no mysticism, no symbolism. Everything has a practical purpose in the house of Islam. No mysticism, no symbolism. Yes, ma'am. Why do you Muslims wear the hat? The question is why do the Muslims wear the hat? You see, if it, <laughs> I might ask you, ma'am. I said, you see, your dad or your husband, when he goes to church, he takes off his hat. Does he? Yes. So I'm asking why? Why does the gentleman take off the hat? So the man tells me, he says, to show respect. But I said, you're telling your wife to put it on? He said, yes. I said, what for? He says, to show respect. I said, how can you be doing opposite things to show respect? So that you might have been reading Shakespeare. So he said, you see, Shakespeare said, nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so. I said, exactly. You see, in the mind of we people from the East, this is a sign of humility. <laughs> this is arrogance. To you, this is arrogance and this is humility. For example, an African needs a job and you need it, and I'm fine, you know, somebody to do a garden for you. So he comes along with a hat on or a cap. Sasakbona, Mrs. Sasakbona. He says, Prum Sabenzu, you'll never give him a job. This is this arrogant lout, you know, you know. Look at him. You know, he says, Seven days, you know, Sabenzu, he's got a chance. He's got a chance. No, it's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. It's, it's nothing religious. This is all in the mind. You know, to us, this is a way of showing humility. To you, this is showing humility. <laughs> shoes. Uh, shoes, you see, ma'am, we say we are doing this in respect of the commandment given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses. When he was on Mount Sinai, God spoke to him and he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. In Afrikaans, and he said, Muni nadar komni, trek yo skuna, fan yo futa af. On the plek where you upstand, is heli khakhon. So now, in respect of that commandment, we take off our shoes. But now, there are certain practical reasons also. For example, in our prayer, you notice that, you know, we go eventually with our faces down into the dust, praising the Lord, but you have been walking around with your shoes, all over, you know, cow dung, horse manure, we, we, can, we can bring in, and now, you know, we expect somebody else to put his face into it. So there are certain practical reasons also, but in respect of the commandment given by God to Moses, we take off the shoes. But it also says all this, in, you know, when we put our faces, it's a clean place. No, um, some of us, we wear all the time, like myself, I wear all the time. But uh, today, according to mod modern practice, generally the people, you know, they keep it in the pockets and when they come to the mosque, they put it on. <laughs> but um, those who do, they put it on all the time. <laughs> yes, you, um, Do Muslims believe that Jesus was a very holy man, that he was spiritual, close to God, and that he actually worked miracles in the name of God the Father? Do you believe that? We believe that Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. What do you believe of the fact that he's actually claimed to be God, doesn't that make him an out and out liar? If, if he did claim to be God, that would be something. Well, yeah. But what we you see, but what we Muslims say, what we Muslims say, that there is not a single unequivocal statement in any version of the Bible where Jesus says I'm God or where he says worship me. If you have such information, any time you bring it and show it to me in any version of the Bible. So look, Jesus says, I'm God. And he says, worship me. I said, I'll join your church straight away. And I'll worship him as God. And 
you know, I'll accept him as God. Well, in many places in the Bible it says that Jesus is referred to as the Word of God. And it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right. Jesus existed right from the beginning of time. As no, I, God, I, I God think you didn't hear my, my, my statement. I said, where Jesus says, see the man must make the claim. The man himself. You say, you know, you go away and you say, you know, I met the Pope of the Muslims and you know, he was talking to us and I asked him a question and I stumped him. I said, look, please, excuse me. Did somebody can ask you? He said, did the man say he was the Pope? He says, no. What did he claim? He said, I don't know. I said, look, don't put anything upon the man which he didn't claim. He said, now, what did Jesus say? He says, he says, my father is greater than I. My father is greater than all. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He said, of that day, know what no man, no, not the angels, nor the sun, but the Father in heaven. In my knowledge, I'm not like God. In my power, I'm not like God. He said, all power is given unto me, it is not mine. Look, this is what the man of God is saying, and we accept. Where does he say, I'm God? Where does he say, worship me? He doesn't. On the contrary, he's humbling himself, I am Speaking whatever is given to me, that I speak. See, the word you hear are not mine, but the Father that sent me. He had given me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Even as the Father has said unto me, so I speak. Where does he say, I am God? Where does he say, worship me? I am prepared to... Yeah, these are interpretations. We give something, he said, I am a Father, I want. He said, he that has seen, has seen the Father. I said, you see now, I said, look. If you want an explanation, I'll explain to you what I see. But that doesn't mean he says, I'm God. Said, he must say, I'm God, because if my salvation depends on that, he must make a clear-cut statement, I am God, worship me. And if he is God, and if he said that, if I don't worship him, I'll be lost. I'll go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. But the man never made any such claims. Yes, ma'am. When, um, do all your children have to learn Arabic? And if so, when do they learn it? Uh, from very small. All the children have to learn. Almost every Muslim in the world knows some portion of Arabic. Because in our prayer, we can't do our prayer without Arabic. So every Muslim in the world, whether in China, or whether in Indonesia, Turkey, wherever they are, they must know some portion of Arabic to fit themselves into the congregational prayer. Is it school? At school. Is it our, own, school? our own religious school. Uh -huh. But we start at home. While they are small, you know. Instead of teaching them Baba, Black Sheep, Ring a Ring a Rosy, we start teaching them, you know, the Word of God. We start from small. Yes, sir. I there's a, a recess or a niche down there. Next yes. Week. What is the purpose? That niche there, you see, my ancestors, my forefathers, a thousand years ago they invented that for the purpose of acoustics. Because the Imam now is not talking to the congregation. He's facing in that direction. Everybody is facing the same direction. So, Allah Akbar, the voice is thrown back. But today we have the mic system. You know, we don't need that. But it has a, become a part of our architecture. You can't imagine a mosque today without that. Because for a thousand years it has been there. And sometimes the mic might fail. So it still serves the purpose. I think, for your benefit, this will be the last question, so we can enjoy something to eat as well. I, by God, I tell you, I love to talk. Oh, you see now we have certain fixed time of prayer. So we come sometimes before time, and we want to offer some optional prayer. So you want to know whether you have time enough for that. Because while you are in the midst of it, and the call goes, and you are neither here nor there. So this is... To make it easy for the person to say, look, mm -hmm, yeah, I still have five minutes and I can perform so many movements of prayer during that period of time. So, just to assist the person from, in case he hasn't got one on his wrist. Yeah. Uh, yes, this will be the last minute. <laughs> for, yes, ma'am. Will you discuss the concept of Islamic marriage and divorce and adultery and the Old and the New Testament? Yes, ma'am. A big order, ma'am. <laughs> in Islam, marriage is very simple. A man and a woman agreeing to get married in front of two witnesses, it's over. But now, for the purpose of society, we want the people to know a young man, suppose he's done that, and I see him walking along with somebody's daughter, so 
thought goes to say, look, when there are these young people going, you know, they are up to mischief. So for that reason, we try and make it as, you know, make a big noise in the mosque, so look, so-and-so, uh, son is going to marry so-and-so's daughter, and on a Saturday evening, let everybody come along and witness it for that purpose. But the requirements are, a man and a woman agreeing to marry in front of two witnesses, it's all over. Divorce also in Islam is allowed. See, in the, in the, in the time of Jesus, see, Jesus took away the privilege. But the Jews had a law of divorce. Before, before Jesus, they had. In the, before Moses, they had a law of divorce. And their law was, if a man got angry with his wife, he could tell her, I divorce you and go. And they were doing that. You see, the Jews did that. They had got rid of the woman. And then afterwards, the man changes his mind. You know, he says, man, this woman is to work like a donkey, you know, free of charge. Let me bring her back. So he goes back to the father-in-law's house, tells his ex-wife, he says, come on, back home. So what for? So what do you mean, what for? So look, you divorced me. So no, I sent you for a little holiday, and now you come, come, catches her by the hair and brings her back. <laughs> so Moses, seeing that abuse, he evolved the law. The law, God evolved it through him. He said, whosoever puts away his wife, let him give her a bill of divorce. Means put it down into writing. So you can't go back on your words. Beautiful. He said, this is now, you know, the law is getting tighter. You want to divorce a woman? Give it in writing. Now, my Jewish cousins, they're my cousins, you see, very ingenious. They were then, still now, very ingenious people. So, they found a way out. They found a way out. You see, they married a woman, she got half a dozen children, and she's not the same anymore, you know, nice and crisp. He wants something nice. <laughs> he wants to get something young now. So, what does he do? This is a liability. So, he writes out a bill. He said, darling, go. <laughs> Look, he's within the law. The law says, give her a bill of divorcement. So he said, look, I give her a bill of divorcement. Then he gets another one, he gets her into difficulties, to get rid of her, very easy. What? Give her a bill of divorcement. Give it to him writing. He gives. Now Jesus Christ, another spiritual physician among the Jews, he sees this abuse, and he tightens that. He says, look, except for fornication, no divorce. He takes away the privilege. He takes away the privilege of divorcing, because the people are playing fast and loose. If he's going to create any other you know, they'll find other loopholes, so he takes away the privilege. So this is the evolution taking place. But now, we said, Jesus Christ didn't have the time or the opportunity to give you a remedy for all your sicknesses. So he said, I have yet many things to say, and there is somebody coming after me who will guide you into all truth. And we Muslims, we say that that spirit of truth is Muhammad, and has gathered mankind that if it must, if you want to divorce, there is a chapter in this book. There's a chapter, whole chapter is dedicated to divorce. How to go about? You don't have to go and wash your dirty linen in public. You know, as the Westerner does. He has private detectives to spy on his wife, take some compromising pictures, and he takes them to court and says, you see this woman? You don't have to do that. There is a system laid out in this book, how to divorce, if you must. But in Islam it's allowed, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad he said, that one thing that is lawful in the sight of God, divorce, is the most hateful. It's lawful but most hateful. When a man divorces his wife, he says the heavens and the earth, they shudder. Metaphorically, they shake. Such a horrible thing. But if it comes to part nicely, there is a way. Part nicely, give her some gifts and say, darling, you go find a better husband, I'll find a better wife. <laughs> so now, uh, please go and enjoy yourself. And before leaving, each householder, each householder, Please take one. If there are two different families living in one house, you can take two. But otherwise, one each. And if you run short, please contact us.